Guys, he's want to make your way over. James. What are you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> ah, we're back again. The team's back. You're on your coffee, sir. Hi. <laughs> I'm born to remember Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce was the greatest. He was the greatest leader that Scotland ever had. And when you read the history of Robert the Bruce, it's an absolutely unbelievable story of a man that never gave in. And that is a mission of the Scottish resistance. We will never give up the hope for Scotland's freedom. For St Andrew, for the Bruce, and for freedom! Repeat after me. For St Andrew! For St Andrew! For the Bruce! For the Bruce! And for freedom! Robert the Bruce was not the original heir to the Scottish throne. There was a dispute in the Scottish throne between the Bruces and the Balliols. Unfortunately, the people who were the nobles of Scotland decided to invite in as arbiter Edward the First. That was one of the worst mistakes that was ever made in Scottish history. Inviting a tyrant like Edward the First to decide who would be King of Scots. Now believe it or not, Robert the Bruce's grandfather was actually the claimant to the throne. And he was 80 years of age. 80 years of age. Because Scotland right up until the death of Alexander III. And that is when, that's when, who's saying something to somebody be cancelled? That's Mr. Alistair MacDonald, the folk singer, just arrived. Yeah. Round of applause. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, Alexander III fell from his horse at Kinghorn and Fife. It led to a dispute of the Scottish throne, Robert the Bruce. He was the claimant to the throne along with John Balliol, who ended up with the unfortunate name of Tomb Tarbert, or Empty Coat. What happened, of course, Edward I, who was brought in as arbiter, decided it would be great to pick uh, Balliol because the Bruces were a very, very powerful family. They owned land in Scotland and in England, so he chose Balliol and made him uh, kowtow to English rule. He was more like a puppet king. But what happened after Balliol was installed as king, uh, what happened was the taxes went up higher in Scotland because uh, the taxes from the Scots went down to Westminster, just as, ha just as is happening just now. And what happened, Balliol 
to give the man his due. He did fight back. He created the old alliance between the French and the Scots. And he did manage to get some French support against the tyrant Edward I. He started an uprising, but unfortunately the battle uh, ended at Dunbar in Scotland when Edward I invaded. Uh, it's a long story, but I want to get on with it uh, into the story of the Bruce. So basically what happened, uh, Tomb Tabard, empty coat, he actually resigned as, uh, and gave up the crown of Scotland. So Scotland was under the tyrant king Edward I of England. Now what happened after that? This, start, this was the start of the rise of Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce was crowned king of Scots in 1306. Shortly after that, Bruce's brothers and any patriots who were caught by the English unfortunately suffered a terrible fate of being hung, drawn and quartered. Bruce's brothers, Thomas and Alexander Bruce, 20 and 21, they were captured near Carlisle. They were taken to Carlisle and they were hung, drawn and quartered. It wasn't just William Wallace that was hung, drawn and quartered. Lots of Scottish patriots were hung, drawn and quartered. This was a punishment of the tyrant king, Edward I. Shortly after that, Nigel Bruce, he was the next in line after Robert the Bruce. He was actually captured near Berwick and he was taken to the, the, the centre of Berwick where he was hung, drawn and quartered. The other brother of Robert the Bruce was Edward Bruce. Now Edward Bruce was a great leader of men. He recaptured Rutherglen Castle. And believe it or not, we had a rally there last year for Edward Bruce. Shortly after that rally, the plaque that's on the wall to remember Edward the Bruce has gone missing. I've spoken to the council, they say they know nothing about it. So somebody stole the plaque to remember the fact that Edward the Bruce recaptured Rutherglen Castle. We've got enemies, folks. They don't want people to know Scotland's history. They'll do anything to stop us. We've got to fight back. I want to get the history of Scotland out to all of the people. Once the people know their history, there'll be no stopping Scotland getting its independence. Believe me. And it's my mission in the Scottish Resistance, along with the other members, made members of the Resistance, to spread the message of Scotland's history. Now, to go back to Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce, for many years, was on the run. He hid in caves, he got help from many patriots to escape the English who were after him. Now, eventually he did have some success. He won a few battles. And he got ready for the biggest battle he faced, which was here on Bannockburn Field. In midsummer of 1314, Robert the Bruce, along with great patriots that followed him, like the Black Douglas, his right hand man, who commanded the division of the army, Thomas Randolph, another great Scottish patriot, was by the side of Robert the Bruce. He also had his brother, Edward the Bruce who commanded the division of the Scottish army at the Battle of Bannockburn. All these patriots lined up, but it must have been some sight watching the English army approach, because they reckoned it was probably about 50 divisions wide. It was the biggest army that the English ever brought to Scotland. They were going to totally destroy Scotland once and for all in Midsummer's Day of 1314, but one thing they didn't account for was Robert the Bruce. This man was magnificent in his strategy. He actually went away out in front of his troops, just on the eve of Bannockburn, to view the English army and work out how he planned to fight an army which was much larger than the Scottish army. While he was away out in front of the Scottish army, a knight from England called Henry de Boone, who had quite a reputation as being a reputable fighter, spotted the Bruce away out in front of his army. And he says, I'm going to take her out. 
So he charged towards Robert the Bruce, but Robert the Bruce sidestepped him and with one smack of his axe, the boon was down on the ground. Robert the Bruce was a great fighter for Scotland's freedom. Many times when he was on the run, he was outnumbered and overcame overwhelming odds, just as he did on the day at Bannockburn against a much bigger army. He made sure that the cavalry of the English were in to the low ground of the Bannockburn, which was all soft. I don't know whether they did it deliberately, they maybe poured water on there to make it soft, but certainly we knew that Bruce had a strategy and it worked because we had the greatest victory ever over the English at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 thanks to Robert the Bruce, the greatest hero that Scotland will ever have. Thank you very much. I'm now going to introduce a legend to you. This man I've followed ever since he done his first record. Alistair MacDonald. I've got all his LPs, I've got all his cassettes, I've got all his CDs. This man is fantastic. I'm going to, I'm going to hand you over to Alistair MacDonald. Yeah, yeah come on. Alistair. Friends, it's good to be here. I apologise to James for in interrupting his flow by arriving late. I mean, that's what you've got to put up with when you deal with a McDonald's. Thanks very much. <laughs> Although, I believe we were on time at Bannockburn, but I wish I could have carried that tradition forward today and not interrupted a blog that was speaking. Thanks very much. Can you cope with that okay? I've got absolutely nothing to add to what James has already said. All I can do, really, is offer you this song. Beware of one thing, though. Ballads are songs made by human beings who can be flawed in their intentions. So they are not holy writ, they are not historical documents, they are simply items by which we might be inspired. In 1320, Scotland said, Should England dare our soil to trade? Now the need to foreign prince, swear he be, For come what may, will I be free from job and domination? Here's to the, here's to the men who took the oath, the men who, and, and, some to do with the, uh, with the declaration of her broth, which I have gone sailing into, only because the tune is called Follow Me Up to Carlo. And straightened it out into a fortune to you. The stoutest force that e'er was seen around the bannock water. To crush the Scots was Edward's boast and rule the land from coast to coast. Let Scotsmen quail before his host like lambs before the slaughter. But draw the sword at bannock one, three Scottish dignity return. Out the foreign tyrant learn each man is at his station. Join the lion of the north, drive the false and fader forth to show the world old Scotland. Historians disagree about the exact numbers, but most of them agree in the fact that the uh, proportions from one to the other was about right. The Scots outnumbered three to one, take up their places on the run. The children's in the morning sun, defiant as the thistle. The English lights of armour bright present an awesome fearful sight. Behind each mountain southern night, the spears and lances bristle. But draw the sword, or and tire, and learn each man is at his station. Join the lion of the north, and drive the false invader forth to show the world old Scotland's worth, an independent nation. The mercenary knight, de Boon, in armour black from toe to plume, spurs out to change the British tune to Coronach of Sorrows. He thunders straight across the plain, Bruce wheels his pony in disdain, and drives his axe.
And learn each man is at his station. Join the Lion of the North and drive the false invader forth to show the world all Scotland's worth an independent nation. Then charge the English to the field, towards the hedge of Scottish steel, and into mud and carnage reel in waves of dead and fallen. The Ettrick archers join the fray and send aloft their deadly spray, and countless in the saddle slay, whose death knell now is tolling. The name of the name of Wallace sing with pride, McNeil and Stuart brave beside, and all who joined that gallant tide to stem the south's advancing. And here's to Robert Bruce by name, our own true king, renowned in fame, his flag like red and yellow flame, in Scotland's honour dancing. Here's to the Bruce at Bannockburn, well many Scottish. Here's to the Bruce at Bannockburn, with pride each Scottish heart should burn, as Edward back to London turns to mourn his fallen glory. Hail the Lion of the North, drive the false and fatal forth, to show the world all Scotland's worth and place in freedom's story. Yeah. I came along here in such a hurry. Yes, I, yes I, maybe I could. Maybe I could. Yes, I know, Donald. Yeah, sure. I'll do my best at that. Hey, it's not often I get requests, and I only do requests when I'm asked. But, um, it really is good to be here. I've already apologised for my late coming. I apologise now for not, not being able to remember the words to my own song. But then it's hard when you're your own tribute act, you know, it really is. So all I can say is it really is a, a delight for me to be part of any kind of thing at all that has gone down. And this movement has gone on. What started at 1314 had actually been building up. And it still goes on today. There are people who are prepared to put themselves out. As a matter of fact, if you would, uh, if you would turn and look at the banner behind me, you'll see a face there. And that's the face of a man called John McLean. And this year, when uh, we remember, or at least we commemorate, the, um, the signing of the uh, Declaration for Irish Independence and the foundation of the Republic, which it has become, then uh, it's good to know that people uh, actually did join that struggle who had a lot full in many cases we could quote people who had far more to lose in their uh, in their efforts uh, for the country than you or I might ever dream of owning in a lifetime people did give themselves out John McLean was an educated man he was a teacher and he had a lot to lose in standing against the uh, first world war as being a rich man's war he said that whether you fought on the side of the butcher's apron, sometimes known as the Union Jack, or whether you fight on the side of the Kaiser, you were both bound to lose. Because in a situation like that, it's the working man that's sent out to do the fighting. John McLean was just one man who stood up against that. Now, Jim was very kind, and James was kind and invited me along here today. Such are the vagaries of our Scottish climate, as well as our Scottish temperament. Uh, even the uh, lovely sunshine that we're enjoying can affect instruments such as these. Right. At one time, John McLean was incarcerated in Peterhead Prison. He went on hunger strike there. And a poet and patriot called Morris Blythman, who took the uh, really patriotic pseudonym of Furzo Berwick, I mean, you think about it, that's as good a pseudonym for Scotland as you can get. That's the top and bottom of it, if you like. When you pass your resolutions and you feel you've done your bit and you think there's nothing in your action, the man in Peterhead who acts for you, he is grateful for your money, he appreciates your cheers, and your sympathy is ample for his needs. But there are more important things than resolutions, cash or tears. 
Why not give him just a sample, say, of deeds? Why not give him just a sample, say, of deeds? T'was for you he garnered knowledge, sacrificed his very youth. He worked for you until his head was grey. They are killing him by inches just because he thought the truth. And having thought it, had the guts to say For the truth's a kind of virtue That the ruling classes fear By the foulest means to crush it They have tried For truth the stones of hate Were hurled at prophet and at seer For truth the gentle Christ was crucified for truth, the gentle Christ was crucified. Will you suffer his destruction on the tyrant's battleground? Will you let the cursed wrong defeat the right? Ah, he is one against an army. Are you going to see him down? Are you going to... It's you who stand to despair. Then, workers, for your own sakes, liberate McLean. You could do it, I tomorrow, if you dare. You could do it, I tomorrow, if you dare. I couldn't be here before you today and not pay some kind of tribute to the people who really have given themselves out on paper, as it were, as well as active in other areas, to give us the songs that we can actually be inspired by. Let me repeat, they are not sacred documents. They are items by which we might be inspired to find out the truth insofar as we're able to find it. Jim McLean of Paisley was just one such man. And he wrote one, and you might think this is a bit dated on me offering it to you just now, but I have reasons which I hope you would be patient enough to let me get to. Oh, I am a Scottish MP from a city grey in the south, just in case they send me back. Now there's some who work for labour, and there's some for the Tory class Ah, but I ring the bell for me myself And the rest can kiss my kilt And so I'm off to London in the morn, in the morn In Westminster I will be And I'll leave behind my brains and mind And try for an MB Based, of course, on the belief that when a Scottish MP got down as far as Westminster, the first thing he would do is remember to forget us. Aye. Oh, Scotland, dear Scotland, you have given me your trust. And if I make the grade to the Board of Trade, just guess who I'd trade first. Why, I would trade the lowlands for a peerage. Give me an earldom for the isles with one of Lizzie's smiles. And so I'm off to London in the morn, in the morn, in Westminster I will be. And I'll leave behind my brains and mine and try for an MBE. Now I am a Scots home ruler, but at my English Queen's command. For my real birthright is to be a knight, and the rest can be Republicans. And so come Grimmond Hume and poor old Georgie Brown, our Scottish English men, a nationality for a Scots MP means tea at number 10. Why do I sing this song today? Well, it's very easy. As far as I'm concerned, this is an opinion only. 
I'm not here to lead anybody's mind or tell them what they should do. But to me, the idea of independence from Westminster, good. Independence from Brussels, bad. Now, there's a logic that escapes me somehow. As a matter of fact, based largely on Jim McLean writing this song, was the fact that uh, there were expense scandals back in the 60s, expensive scandals back in the 60s that really only came to our notice a couple of years ago. And let me tell you that I rather believe, as far as Brussels is concerned, that there's a stack of expensive sheets that some people are literally drooling over right at this minute. So if you were scandalized, by the Westminster expense, because I believe there's a Bobby Dazzler on its way. So I'm off to Brussels, to London, in the morn, in the morn, in Westminster I will be. And I'll leave behind my brains and mind, and try for an MB, try for an MB, try for an MB. How's the public? All right. On a day in which we remember a battle and significant subsequent battles, I gotta say that as a Scots born person of some mature years now, I've gotta say I look at my country and I love it as much as I ever did when I was first drawn uh, to the fact that I should stand up for so be telling the truth about it even when it's not a palatable truth at the age of eight I was brought back at the age of 12 ill health drove us home the Aussies were sick of us <laughs> and from that day to this I've looked at my country with mature eyes I was brought up for the four years that I was in Australia, partly in a school called La Kemba School for Boys, which was an interdenominational school, religious. For an hour a week, like demented amoeba, we separated into various other little closets to be given our own drilling. And for the rest of the time, we were getting on with the business of the hang-ups that assail my uh, friends and neighbours on the west coast of Scotland particularly. As long as we have sectarian tribalism scarring our nation, as long as we have so-called parents murdering their children in the news, the ones that they're supposed to be looking after, then I'm bound to say to my country, we have something wrong with us, which doesn't really get sorted on the battlefield. It's the hearts and minds of people. I applaud James and his colleagues for their efforts in reminding us of our history. God bless them in their efforts. But one thing I've known about the past is there's no future in it. And you don't need to be a genius to work that one out. Yeah. Awareness of a problem is a far, far greater way of solving it. To fight. We'd be led by a king, or a duke, or a knight. But today we are led by a new kind of men who stay home in the White House or safe number 10. So beware of the bush, take care with the blair. These jokers who will send you to goodness knows where to die in the desert, they really don't care. As long as they're safe with their money. I'll sing that again. Beware of the bush. Take care with the blare. These jokers who'll send you to goodness knows where. To die in the desert. They really don't care. As long as they're safe with their money. Those names might be names in history. But the situations can repeat themselves. And so I'm anxious to tell you today that watch out for the people who masquerade under all sorts of names and all sorts of colours simply for their own ends. 
I heard in the news today that even poor old John Major has been brought out for some kind of scoffing match at Brexit. And all I can say is this, what are they doing? Would you believe anybody that could fancy Edwina Curry? No. <laughs> now I have a son, he's the pride of my eye. But I didn't raise him to swan off and die. For dignity apart, it takes too much disgrace to think he might die to save some joker's face. So beware of the bush, take care with the blare. These jokers who'll send you to goodness knows where. To die in the desert, they really don't care as long as they're safe with their money. But still they line up in the khaki and grey to board the big bird that will bear them away. And as they fly off and we pray they'll come back, let's remember the joker that lurks in each pack. And beware of the bush, take care with the blare. These jokers who'll send you to goodness knows where. To die in the desert, they really don't care. As long as they're safe with their money. To die in a desert, well why should they care? For jokers stay safe with their money. Keep to the tank, I can see us all over. Good bra. Well done. Well done. More! <laughs> Here's a curious thing. Sorry about that, pal. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a curious thing. Have you noticed with performers that uh, when they're asked to do an encore, they always seem to have one? Have you, have you noticed that? One, one of these mysteries of the universe yet to be explained to us. I just, uh, a few months ago, took part in something that pleased me enormously, and that was a tribute to the life and legacy of one James Connolly. It was called From the Cougate to Kilmainham, and it traced a James Connolly's birth, life, actions as a trade union organizer, among so many other things, right up to his act of, although he was Scottish born, standing with the Irish people in that rebellion. I was very proud indeed to have played guitar for a man called Dom, my first wife, just to keep her on her toes. Anne came along that night on the eve of our on the eve of our wedding, and I thought she wanted to meet Dominic, which would have been a good enough reason. No, 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 no. I discovered many years later that she came along just to make sure I didn't give the concert in Glasgow and waking up in Dublin. There lies a page in history when the worker first fought back. When the mile of exploitation at last began to crack In farm and field and shipyard, in workshop, mine and mill There sprang a light, a beacon bright, that flame is burning still Connolly was there, Connolly was there Oh, great, brave and daunted, James Connolly was there When the bosses tried to sweat the lads away on Glasgow's Clyde A voice like rolling thunder, it soon shook them in their stride In Liverpool and Belfast, the workers' lives were hell Until at last they organised, and any man can tell Connolly was there, Don to James, Connolly was there Scottish-born James Connolly, citizen of the world and worker for the people. Now William Martin Murphy and his Dublin millionaires 
Tried bribery and corruption, hypocrisy and prayers To smash the transport union, the scabs he did enlist But all their graft was sh Connolly was there Oh great brave and daunted James Connolly was there In 72 in Glasgow there was anger to a man when what came to the upper Clyde, the closure was the plan. Then up stepped Reed and Daly, in language true and plain. Remember how your fathers fought? Well, stand up once again. And Connolly was there. Connolly was there. Oh, great, brave, and daunted, James Connolly was there. A most kind chap asked me if I might have any CDs with me. And it's not until you hear it, hears them just how stupid they are. Because at the time when I might have said, oh, is the Pope a Catholic? But I heard just recently from a lady whose grandfather was Polish, and to him English was his second language. And he asked somebody, would you like a drink? And they said, oh, is the Pope a Catholic? And his answer was, of course. How stupid we can be, even our whimsy. They say that he was murdered, shot dying in a chair. But go march on to freedom now, and workers don't despair. In farm and field and shipyard, in workshop, mine and mill. That shining light, that beacon bright, that flame is burning still. And Connolly is there. Connolly is there, oh great brave and daunted James Connolly is there. I was trying to move my legs when that duck was around there, just in case, just in case he was going to offer a criticism. Yes, Connolly was there, Connolly was there, oh great brave and daunted James Connolly was there. Give me the time. Thanks, Jimmy. Well, wasn't that fantastic there, uh, Alistair MacDonald? Absolutely brilliant. I think we should give him another round of applause, everybody. I've got to say, Alistair's came here for no fee. He's done this for Scotland. So, give the man a, a, a clap. Now, I'm going to tell you about Wendy Wood. Wendy Wood was the co-founder of the National Party that became the Scottish National Party. She was also the person who founded the Scottish Patriots. Now, I've got pictures here of Wendy Wood. That's my father there, that's with Wendy Wood. This was taken away back in the 70s. Now, my father was a great Scottish nationalist. He brought our family up, he taught us our history, and he made sure that we would carry on the fight for Scotland. I've got my brother here to my right, Donald. I've got my sister to the left. Now, I've got to tell you, my dad fought all his life for independence for Scotland. He died on the 1st of July, 1998, exactly one year before the Scottish Parliament opened in Edinburgh, 1st of July, 1999. Now, when my dad died, he would be scattered on Bannockburn Field. And that is exactly what happened, guys. My dad's ashes are scattered on the field of Bannerbon. A great patriot, and I'll never forget him. 
I'm now going to introduce Gwen Sinclair. I told you about some of the Bruce brothers who were hung, drawn and quartered. Gwen's going to tell you about the Bruce women and what they suffered under the tyranny of Edward the First. Gwen, are you there? Morning, Gwen. Morning. Yeah. That's it, that's it. Boom. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'd just like to say before I um, go in to talk about the Bruce women, independence, and obviously behind the scenes in Bannockburn, uh, Bruce had been married previously and then he had a second wife who was called Elizabeth de Burke. She was originally from Antrim in Ireland. She was the daughter of a very high nobleman from Northern Ireland. And uh, they got married basically on the 27th of March, 1306. And they were both, sorry, they were married previous to that, but they got, they got crowned king and queen shortly after that on the 27th of March, 1306. And um, it was basically seen as a defiance against the English claims over what they called suzerainty over Scotland. And she herself felt very concerned. And her words were, alas, we are but the King and Queen of May, which was going on in the background. And three months later, sure enough, after the defeat of the Battle of Methven on the 19th of June, was 1306, Robert the Bruce decided to send Elizabeth, his queen, his, his daughter Marjorie from his previous marriage, and his two sisters Mary and Christina to Kildrummy Castle with his brother Nigel. The English army laid siege to the castle at Kildrummy. And the story goes that the blacksmith was bribed with, his, with all the gold he could carry to set fire to their food store. And so the siege, fa siege failed. The Bruce women fled with the Earl of Athol to Tain under the sanctuary of the church, but were captured by the, the English at the behest and the betrayal of William II, the Earl of Ross. Meanwhile, back in Kildrummy, the failed siege men Edward's troops laid claim to the castle. All the men were killed, as they say, by hanging, being drawn and quartered. And that also included Nigel Bruce, Bruce's brother. The women were taken prisoner and taken to England. Bruce's sister Mary and her companion Isabella Macduff, the Countess of Buchan, were hung in cages and held outside the castle's walls of both Roxburgh and Berwick. The command was given about Isabella Macduff. Let her be closely confined in an abode of stone and iron in the shape of a cross, and let her be hung out of doors in the open buried air, that in both life and after her death, she will be a spectacle. The Macduffs had always been had to be there at any coronation, so there was an extra special punishment for her. She had been at the coronation of um, Bruce and the Queen. Bruce's daughter, Marjorie, was then nine years old, was taken to a convent in Wharton in Yorkshire, and she was held mainly in solitary confinement. Elizabeth, his wife and queen, was held under severe conditions and for eight years at different, six different locations, including Windsor Castle. She wasn't allowed to set foot outside. It was only after the battle here at Bannockburn they were able to find some way to get each of the Bruce women um, freed. And she was moved from... They, they went on to have three children who all reached adulthood. Matilda, Margaret and David, who would become David II of Scotland. His daughter had a very difficult time later, as we know that she fell from the horse and had to have a cesarean given to save the child and she herself died. So they, basically the women suffered an enormous ordeals because they were supporting their family and, and, and being kings of Scotland. So it's not a very nice history I'm afraid. So I put a dark, dark cloud over a lovely day with these stories but anyway basically I just think that we need to remember that behind the scenes there's so many thousands of people who were totally on side for Scotland's independence.
and as we pay tribute to Bruce, we should pay tribute also to everybody else who were on site at that time. I've also got a wee message that I'd like to give, and it was from Brian Quayle, I think some of you will know, who's a member of Scottish CND. He's also an Indy independence champion. And he said he was here with us in spirit, because he's actually down at the, he says, I'm down at the H-bomb factory at Bur Burrowfield, standing up against nuclear weapons coming to Scotland. I don't know if you know, any of you know Brian, he was the um, man who lay down in front of the nuclear convoy yeah. recently going through Balloch. So uh, just to see with he in spirit. So. Okay, well, thanks very much. Well done. Well done. Well done, well done. Well done Gwen. Gwen. Well, at this point, we should have had the folk singer Dave Whitten, who said he was going to come here, but I don't think he's arrived. Are you there, Dave? No, he's not here. We'll move on. Now, in 1320 which was six years after the Battle of Bannockburn, we made a declaration called the Declaration of Our Broth. And the words in the Declaration of Our Broth, which are very important, are so long as a hundred Scots remain alive, we will never subject ourselves to the dominion of the English. It is not for glory it is not for riches, neither it is an honour, but it is liberty alone that we fight and contend for which no honest man. I'm now going to ask Sean Clerkin to come up and speak about the Bruce and the Declaration of our Broth. Sean. The Declaration of Our Broth is the most important document in Scottish history. It states unequivocally that the people of Scotland can depose their own king if their king betrays them. So Robert the Bruce was the people's king. The people's king. Because the sovereignty of the people is the all-important thing in Scotland. And the second... Scottish independence is the fight for freedom to death itself. Hence, people like John Maclean, people who fought for social justice in Scotland. The fact is, we had tyranny under Edward I, who ransacked Berwick and killed 17,000 people in Scotland's second largest city. We then had Edward II, who was put to the sword at Bannockburn to get rid of that tyranny to win Scotland's freedom. But today, today we still have tyranny ruling our country from Westminster. And we need to get rid of that. Because what do we have? We have food banks where people are starving in our own country, where we have school teachers in our Scottish schools who are identifying children suffering from malnutrition. We also have the biggest military threat to the world on the Clyde, just up the coast of Fars Lane, and it's called Trident. And they're going to renew Trident at a cost of 205 billion pounds. Money that can be better spent on developing our welfare state, saving our education system, and developing our national health service. In addition to that, we have down in Glasgow, we have a company, an American company called Maximus, who profits from the misery, from the deaths of the disabled, the sick and the dying, who are forced to go through a work capability assessment. That has to stop. And the only way it is going to stop, friends, comrades and patriots, is through having... A we have to pick up the mantle of the Bruce. We have to pick up the mantle of all the patriots who have suffered and died for their country. We have to fight for Scotland's freedom, not with violence, but with non-violent direct action, with non-violent protest, to get rid of Westminster, 
to get rid of the Tories and their supporters who only profit through tax havens and tax avoidance and who only want to be rich and to kill off the poor through driving them into the penury and the gutter of poverty. And I'll finish up by saying this. Long live Scotland! Let's have a Scotland that is free, that is just, that cares and is compassionate and loves its people! Yes! Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done, Sean. I'm Donald. Donald is a great patriot. I love this guy. This guy has been fighting for independence longer than anybody here. Ah, do you kill yourself? So, Donald, come up and give us a few words. No. Thank you, James, and well done. It's always a pleasure to follow Sean Clerkin, because you know, he hasn't been arrested for the end of his speech. The rest of the announcement got to go after this, which popping things. I'm trying to over it while we're here. But here to commemorate, and not just Robert the Bruce, who was a great hero king and a great leader, speaking English instead of Glaswegian. He did from charging out the woods song. They're just checking his trips, dressed in a wee cast pony. All he had was an axe and his light gear. Now, Devon has come part of the English tanks. They were tanks of the day, big charger, heavy charger, he lances. Great charger, he had no chance. He came out of the woods and he saw Bruce talking to his men. He just charged. Not a very nightly thing to do, or a very honourable thing. Bruce stood still, waited the, the tank and the charger come near, stepped aside, and then gave it to him, cleared his head. So that's the bit that he was talking about. But again, he was a hero king. But we're not just here for him. We're here like Sean, Alistair, and James said, the, people, the poor people suffered every war in any war. Now, the poor people were known as the small folk, not because of their size, because they were no importance, they had no property right. So they were up in the Gilly Hill, which is over there, the night before. Now one tradition says they come charging down near the end, waving cook's ladles and rolling print whatever. The English had another army and fled, beaten anyway. But another tradition said there were Knights Templars, 400 Knights Templars, who were at Berwick, as he mentioned here, and they died to a man fighting for the temple there. And the Flemish, who were Templars and all, out, were offshore firing catacombs from the sea. But Bruce gave them a castle, Castle Sween, a stone castle, and a lot of went to Ireland and became Galaglasses and other Scots Highland clans, you know. So that's one tradition. There's another tradition that's just come out lately. I'd like to believe this was true, or maybe I wouldn't. And that was, the Gillies didn't charge from that hill. They were massacred the night before, about 400 of them, by a Scots traitor. And I won't mention it because Scotland's rich in traitors. And this traitor's so-called noble, massacred all these, these people, men, women, and children, cooks, a lot, just massacred them. So that's the battle, but we're also here to carry on, as somebody said, you know, past, present, future, it's all connected. There's a future in the past that we carry on and we'll have to do. So, our future, of course, is for the Scottish Socialist Republic. And we mentioned the, Gwen mentioned Brian Quayle, the CND, gave a speech for him. He's also the convener of the Scottish Republic Socialist Movement. So what? Somebody has to get it. It's the case rubbish. Gwen uh, mentioned she just Marjorie de Bruce. Now, I've got a family tree by a relative of mine, a stepbrother in England, who's trying to claim all my titles, you know. And we've got the family tree, we're also descended from Marjorie the Bruce too. So maybe I'm connected to Gwen somewhere, Marjorie the Bruce. If I'm looking down that tree, I can see lots of noble names, some I don't want to know. And the biggest trait of all was a guy called Ramsey MacDonald, a relative of mine. And that's the worst kind of trait you can get. He was an IOP, Scottish Republican, and he became Prime Minister. And he said, when I become Prime Minister in the morning, the ladies in London will be queuing up to kiss my hand. And now you know the Labour Party's queuing up to kiss now. It's not a hand, it's a queen's bum, you know. That's the kind of people. Sorry, that's a relative of mine. You can't choose your, your relative, you can choose your friends. And genes have nothing to do with morality. So it doesn't matter who we descended from. But so as far as we're concerned, yes, we'll celebrate the hero king. We'll celebrate the people. And then for, for me, social movement in 1973, he mentioned uh, Morris Blythe, he mentioned Jim McLean, who wrote some of these songs. I have to have a few of his CDs, which I've got for sale for about five pounds. And I've got some of Alice's arena. 
pirated. So as a way of it, uh, some of Alice's CDs for a fiver, uh, better ones. Uh, the guy who wrote them, Jim McLean, he's also a member of the SRS. He lives in London, he runs a record company and all that stuff. So good quality stuff. But the nines went down. On the 25th of this month, there's another body for rally, an annual one. It's, it's been going on since the SNP gave up the rally. When the SNP had this rally, you stand in the middle, and not see the beginning or the end. It's so big, and every pop and every hole is full. Sadly, that's not now, but we'll do our best. We're on a bus from North uh, Hanover Street, lovely name Hanover Street, and we'll charge a £10 or £15, depending on the turnout. Hopefully, we'll get a good turnout at 11.50 and 11 o'clock to come here. And when it's finished, we're going to the Anchor Inn across the road. It's just across the road there. If you walk down that wee lane there, you'll come to it across the road. But if you go with the car, it's the first on your right across the road, a big car park. So if we go there, Today afterwards, we to see some lovely t-shirts and CDs to sell you. And that's where the Cayley will be on the 25th. And it'll be Fiery Jack. They're very good. They sing a lot of songs as well. And Arthur said he might make it along. Let's hope he does. So I think that's what we do with announcements and stuff. It's on there to everyone to come along. Take your flies, please, and march down to the car park. Go down to the anchor in and you can all buy James and I a, a tram. <laughs> well done. 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 I think this has been put down a wee bit low. It must have been that Gwen Sinclair that's put it away down low. <laughs> right, anyway, Doral. Don't go away. Stay there a minute. We are going to award you this certificate. Wonderful. Just turn around and let people see. The Scottish Resistance have given Donald Anderson the certificate of the highest honour of a guardian of Scotland for everything that Donald has done for Scotland. Well done, Donald. Well, thanks, Jim. I'm going to sell it now before I die. I'll be 80 at the end of the, the year, you know. So if any, it's worth any money I'll sell it. It's one we announced for. Please get your permission for it. I was at a funeral on Thursday by a founder member of the social group. His name was He's a community organiser. He's a founder member. As Joel was over there of the welfare rights. I taught them how to do welfare rights. He formed a paper called The Voice, East of House Voice. And he fought against corruption. You won't guess which party was most corrupt. They fought against it. Labour. Fought against lots of things. They formed the Easter House Festival Committee. And they weren't just a festival, they won Fringe first. If you've heard of Freddie Anderson, they won the play for John McLean, Cassidy, Russian for Beautiful and Red. And lots of these actors went on to become big actors on the screen. And Stan was one of these background people who just walked away. And he fought for everything, he fought for independence, he fought for Ireland as well. He did literally, you know, he wasn't Irish, he wasn't Catholic, he wasn't a Celtic fan. He just hated bigots. And he hated the British state, and it was the right thing to do to support Ireland. And Stan had his funeral, and he was buried with his SNSF colour party uniform, and the flag on his spot. So if you, if you don't think, I know, not only after a minute's silence, but not for Stan, not last for his Irish plan in morning, and I'll explain that quickly. When Freddie Anderson died, he was at the Glasgow Irish Point, but half of his ashes in Ireland, the other half of a broth. And I flung it over the fence, because we're not allowed in the Abbey, because Accusers are burning up, which is even, you know, which is even, you know, that thing. Aye. So we flung his ashes over and I flung a wee Glen Wandy. And the ashes, I swear, did a U turn and come back. And Rosie Kane was speaking at the night with her two daughters and they were covered in Freddie's ashes and white. You know? so, that's, so what we did with a minute's pandemonium. So can I please ask you, not for a minute's silence, he didn't believe that, he wasn't religious. Can I, a minute's pandemonium for Stan Green. Thanks very much, Donald. Now, as always, this resistance is the only group that allow true democracy. We have an open mic. Anybody who wants to speak, anybody who wants to sing, is free to come up here just now. Anybody want? 
Hello, Fred. Right, we're going to have uh, a few words here from James Smith. It's just at the right level for James, it's a wee bit low for me. <laughs> Hi there. Hi, yeah. I remember Freddie Anderson, an old man, had the grey beard, and he was such a lovely man. I'd done a bit of poetry about Scotland and King James, and Freddie told me my, po my poetry was the best in the world. And I'm going to give you a wee bit, and she thought he's agree, right? Who said let Glasgow flourish? Eugenie God wish? Bad weather man said Michael Fish? Wet, wet rains all the wrong time. The water rain and the brainstorm. Let me grow wild and long hair raising knowledge. As the brain's tree trunk, special branch of the Lord, I, James, twigged and how to use my wooden head's Bible log book. A James adjust and just the sun seeker of God turned over a new gold leafing page to find the poor black and white man's roots of our father, family tree of God. As the Scottish king's own top seed, I wasn't a confused layer, I was replanted deep down the heart of the Kinnam Park's plantation land. I was reborn a deep baby pink in colour, and the Scottish women believed I was their reincarnation of a pink carnation, sunflower of Scotland. And since pink was a genius genius of all Mother Nature's dying plants, St Mungo, the Glasgow Green Bookkeeper, said this one. Given some Mother's Day sun chance, we grow up be some high and mighty prince, an excellent peace prize thoughts and the unrest of the world, covered by his story, of a gay K Adam and Eve story. Believe that in the Bible book, Bill Knox Fox, because it was even the madman who deceived him to sell come a woman at the church speaking madam. I, the law barrels, bad apple mac, was the first of all my Budweiser's to take the old Bill and Ben Johnson's New Testament test that butter melts and loudmouths who try and soil, spoil the garden party A Bible Johnson. As an evil wheat head, he's always had a screw crew cut of young boys, parting from his gardener gad's middle side said, Schumann being a James Gardner, look under the rock fells and you'll find Bonnie Prince Charlie hiding his secret gay boy's naked truth of dandelion bull. Miss Parker bowls me over. Who do you think Charlie was talking to? Me, you silly little the pink plant pot smoker for Sunday joints. Go on, James. Thanks for that, James. Anybody else want to speak or sing? I'm not allowed. Yeah, you're allowed. Of course you are. Right, today with us we have got a very special guest from Holland, Raymond Dijkstra. Are you there, Raymond? Come up, come here, come up here, Raymond. I've got some for you. We are going to award you this certificate, Raymond, for everything you've done for the Scottish resistance. This man spent so much time helping the cause and this should be remembered. So we're giving Raymond this certificate here, the highest honour, the Guardian of Scotland Award. Okay, now we're going to finish up with Scott Swahey. And I think, well, anybody want to sing it? I know that Gwen's a singer. You want to come and sing this, Gwen? Come on, Gwen, sing. Go on, you have Phil, hey. Go on, come on. Come on. I've got all the words. I'll, I'll sing with you if you want. Everybody is to join in. Welcome to your glory bed, art of victory. Now's the day, now's the hour. See the front of battle hour. See approach proud Edward's power, chains and slavery. Oh, will be a traitor knave. Walk and fill a coward's grave. Was the base as be a slave? Let him turn and flee. Woe for Scotland's king and law. 